Tonight, Uber faces a new PR storm over a threat to dig up dirt on journalists. Fitbit data is now being used in court. And what's in Apple's new watch kit? Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 218 for Tuesday, November 18th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. Now introducing Squarespace 7 with even better site management tools and other improvements. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TECHNIGHT. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's tech feed. Uber really seems to have a PR problem these days. So here's the latest. At a recent dinner attended by a BuzzFeed editor in New York, Uber senior vice president of business, Emil Michael, suggested that the company might consider hiring a team of opposition researchers to dig up dirt on media critics and to spread details of the personal life of a specific journalist who has in the past, in the recent past, criticized the company. Now, BuzzFeed published the details of the conversation, noting that the dinner was at no point off the record, though Michael says that he believed it was. In a statement through Uber Monday evening, he said he regretted what he had said and that it didn't reflect his or the company's views. An Uber spokesperson also has said publicly that Uber has clear policies against executives looking at journalists' travel logs or other personal data collected by Uber. CEO Travis Kalanick also apologized about the incident to Uber users via Twitter. Quite a long Twitter tweet storm, in fact. Can your activity monitor be used for or against you in a court of law? Well, a law firm in Calgary, Canada, is working on the first known personal injury case that would use activity data from a Fitbit to help show the effects of an accident on their client. The woman in question was injured in an accident four years ago. Fitbits weren't even on the market four years ago, but she was a personal trainer, and her lawyers are looking to prove that she led an overly active lifestyle. Soon, they'll start processing data from her Fitbit to show that now her activity levels are under a baseline for someone of her age and her profession. The lawyers aren't using Fitbit's data directly. They're actually routing it through analytics platform Viva Metrica, which uses public research to compare a person's activity with that of the general population. Now, this might work in this particular personal injury claim case, but in future prosecutions, it raises some questions. It could open the door for insurers to have access to fitness activity as well and to discredit injury claims. Might be a precedent being set here. Okay, would you like to chat privately with your friends? The answer is probably yes, right? Well, you have another more secure option now, at least if you're an Android user. The most recent update to WhatsApp's Android app includes new end-to-end -end encryption, which is enabled by default. It's the strongest security that any major texting app has ever offered. That includes apps that Google makes and Microsoft makes and Apple makes too. WhatsApp partnered with Open Whisper Systems for the launch using open source code to build in the new features. Now, end-to-end -end encryption means that WhatsApp wouldn't be able to decrypt the messages themselves, even if the company wanted to or was asked to by law enforcement. The company was acquired by Facebook earlier this year, though it's still run independently and currently has 600 million users around the world. A new organization supported by Mozilla and the Electronic Frontier Foundation and other organizations is working to set up a new certificate authority, or CA, called Let's Encrypt that would provide website owners with free secure sockets layer, or SSL, and transport layer security, or TLS, certificates. It's expected to be operational by the second quarter of next year and will be run by the Internet Security Research Group, which is a new California public benefit corporation. So what's the goal here? Well, get as many people as possible to use the TLS protocol, which is more secure than SSL. This new CA would not only provide certificates for free, but would also automate the certificate issuance, the configuration and renewal processes in order to encourage widespread TLS adoption. Let's get secure, everybody. Gosh knows we need it. All right, we got quite a bit of Apple news today, and thank goodness I don't have to go through it alone because it's both on the hardware and software side. So joining us with more is Dave Hamilton of the Mac Observer and Mac Geek Gab. Hi, Dave. Welcome to the show. You've never been on the show before. I've never done this show with you. Thanks for having Yay. me, sir. Oh, I'm so happy to have you. So let's start, let's start <laughs> with let's start with WatchKit. Uh, WatchKit is you know, we, we, we knew uh, WatchKit was 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 going to be part of the you know uh, the 
what developers would get to start making stuff for the Apple Watch that does not exist yet, at least not on anyone's wrists besides probably Tim Cook. So what exactly did Apple announce today? Well, they announced the iOS 8.2 SDK, which is the developer kit uh, that developers use to develop all kinds of software, but specifically this now includes WatchKit. So developers can start developing apps for the watch, but Apple has made it clear that WatchKit uh, in this SDK is incomplete. That's not entirely surprising because there's probably some features of the watch that Apple, A, hasn't finished developing, and B, maybe doesn't want to talk about quite yet. So rolling that out to developers, even though they're under NDA, non-disclosure agreements, mm -hmm. probably not such a good idea. So, so yeah, so they've got the ability to start playing with ideas that they may be able to implement on the watch in the future. Some sort of like watch emulator type thing, I suppose. If you don't have an Apple Watch that you can test things on, at least you can get close and hypothesize how some of this might end up playing out. Yeah, it's going to be tough. I mean, we saw this, you know, the, uh, well, we've seen it many times. I remember when the iPad first came out, many developers uh, tested it in the SDK and then the apps rolled out on the day the iPad launched. And uh, a lot of things didn't work quite the way people thought they would because the emulator doesn't really cut all the way through. Mm. So it's not a fully functioning SDK. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. I did hear that it, sometime uh, in 2015, developers will be able to make standalone Apple Watch apps. So, what, you know, why is this to, sort of to drum up interest and support, see uh, what kind of development interest is out there? I would assume there'd be quite a bit because everybody wants to be first if the platform ends up being successful. Yeah, of course. It's to, well, developers always uh, should be given access to uh, build their apps before customers want their apps, right? Yeah. And, and so as soon as, as soon as people get the watch, people are going to want apps. And that was an interesting thing. In Apple's press release today, it said starting later next year, developers will be able to create fully native apps for the Apple Watch. Now, that's different language than Apple uses for early next year in terms of the release date. It could mean that apps come out, that developers can release apps the day the watch comes out. It could also mean that happens three months later. I asked Apple about this. They haven't gotten back to me yet, but that's not entirely a surprise. So. <laughs> well, it's something Apple <laughs> did do is release uh, specifications for uh, lightning connectors to third-party products. This is very exciting to me because I would love to be able to, you know, maybe buy a slightly cheaper power cord. So what, what are the kind of products that, you know, that we might be able to see? Yeah, so it's more than just power cords. Uh, in fact, people have been able to make power cords for uh, for a while under Apple's certification. Apple has mm -hmm. a an M, this MFI process, right? Made for i, it used to be made for iPod. Now it's iPhone. Maybe it's i device. I don't know. But it's this certification process that Apple says, yes, what you're making fits our standards, and the Lightning connectors uh, fit into that. The Lightning ports, however, did not. So while a, a, a vendor could make a lightning cable or something with a lightning port, say a charging case for your iPhone. They could not put a lightning port on that for you to plug your lightning cable in to charge. So if you were to buy a case that had a lightning port on it and it was all legal, uh, that case would probably have a mini or micro USB connector on it uh, to charge uh, the the battery as opposed to a lightning connector. So now you've got different cables you need to carry around with you and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. So what they did today was they it, they opened up this program uh, for people to be able to to put ports in their devices. So you can use the same lightning cable to charge your battery or or, or case or whatever it is uh, that you use to charge your iPhone. Well, I would say I was more excited about this, but every time I seem to get all of my cables and devices with the same types of ports, then Apple changes it again. So I know. You know. I just I feel like now <laughs> just the last two very months, cynical I feel person. Like, <laughs> yeah, I've finally gotten critical mass on on lightning connectors and I can just reach and grab one and I don't feel like it's the only one I have. Right. Yeah, it's gonna change. That's right. Yeah. Uh, if we <laughs> 
Actually, I don't think it's going to change, but... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, and, and why would it, right? I mean, it's, you know, definition right. of insanity. Uh, Apple also on the software side released Yosemite 10.10.1, which is apparently addressing a, a Wi-Fi issue that a lot of people had, myself included. Um, plus uh, iOS 8.1.1, uh, which uh, we mentioned uh, briefly yesterday, and even an Apple TV update. What stands out to you as is kind of big stuff in, in this bundle? Well, so I'll ask you the question I've been asking everyone since you had the Wi-Fi issue prior. Uh, do you still have it? Uh, no. Well, I really? don't. I don't. Okay. I I haven't had it today, and I yeah. you know updated several hours ago. So no. Sure. Okay. It's all all I, good. I so all to... good so far. But I haven't even given myself twenty four hours. Right. I'm curious what your answer would be tomorrow. Most people that I've talked to uh, say that it happens, and, and this is a Wi-Fi disconnect issue is essentially what it is. Yeah. Uh, and most people that I've talked to that have upgraded that had it still have it just less frequently. Oh, awesome. So, so I've, I should yeah, maybe lower yeah. my expectations just a tiny bit. <laughs> More work to be done. Right. More work to be done think, indeed. To be fair. They weren't clear about which Wi-Fi issue this was supposed to fix. Oh, exactly, so exactly. Else, so if right? I still have them, it's just it was the other one that got fixed. Yes, I'm just right. still on sure. the, you know, just unlucky. Dave Hamilton, thanks so much for being with us. Dave Hamilton from the Mac Observer uh, and first time on TN2, certainly not the last. Before I let you go, let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Sure. MacObserver.com. You can find everything that we do, including the Mac Geek Cab podcast. And you can find me on Twitter at Dave Hamilton. Thanks so much, Dave. Have a good one. Stay, Thanks stay, stay warm. Yeah, I'll do my He's best. He's on the East Coast, so, you know, that's what we say on the West Coast. Stay warm. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Coming up, how many internet-connected devices do you have? One, two, you probably have more than you think, actually. And what's living on comets these days? Science has the answer. It always does. But first, let's thank Squarespace for sponsoring this episode of TN2. It's the all-in-one platform. Hosting, beautiful designs, everything. It makes it easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. I've used Squarespace for years, and I've watched the versions get better and better. And Squarespace 7... I've been playing around with it. I mean, their templates, the way that they walk you through how, how a lot of professionals are using Squarespace to make their site very customized. You know, if you're a musician or or, or, or designer or, or you want to put together a wedding website, I mean, anything you might want to do, Squarespace allows it. You don't have to toggle between the site manager and preview mode in Squarespace 7 anymore. You can preview designs in device mode. That means you can put together a design that you think looks pretty good on the web and then see how it looks on tablets and mobile. Just make sure that you're happy with it across all of the ways that people will be looking at it. Also new, instant access to professional stock photography from Getty. You can get direct purchases to Getty inside the Squarespace platform at just 10 bucks each. Instant branded email setup with Google Apps is new as well. Now you can have branded email for your small business or, you know, if you just need branded email, automatically set up when you sign up for your Squarespace account. And I mentioned the templates. I mean, Squarespace is, it is just the best designs you could possibly get. And these are designs that are ready to go. You don't necessarily even have to customize them at all. You certainly can if you like to, though. Musicians, artists, architects, chefs, the Horizon template is brand new. It's laid out for bands. You know, if you're if you're, you're managing a band or you're in one, merchandise stores. There's e-commerce available for all subscription plan levels. That means you can you can sell things through your Squarespace site. You can also accept donations as well. And plans start at just eight dollars per month. That includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. Squarespace portfolio, note, metric, and blog mobile apps help you be on the go and keep your website alive and well. You can monitor and make changes from anywhere. And of course, that hosting is included. Squarespace takes care of hosting and you don't have to do anything. It's an all-in-one solution. And we'd like you to start a free two-week trial with no credit card required, completely free for two weeks. Right now, start building your website. Take, take, a, take a gander. Go to squarespace.com and, and check out what they've got for you. When you decide to sign up, make sure to use the offer code TECHNIGHT, that's T-E-C-H-N-I-G-H-T, and you'll get 10% off. And you get to show your support for us. Begin using Squarespace 7 existing customers. Just go to the settings tab to activate all those new features. Thanks to Squarespace for their support of Tech News Tonight. A better web awaits 
and it starts with your new Squarespace website. On to a few more stories that we're following today. Google has released a new set of APIs for its in-car software platform, Android Auto, which will let third-party developers build apps that then connect to your car. The first set of APIs support audio and messaging apps, not unlike the launch set of features being offered by Apple with CarPlay. These are kind of, these are competing protocols here. Android Auto is designed to work from your device and then plugging into a car so that apps living on the device instead of the car means that your system will get frequent updates through the life of your vehicle. And we're usually not upgrading our cars every few months when a new version comes out. Devs can't publish their products just yet. That'll happen down the road when Android Auto launches officially in consumer vehicles with partners across the range of car manufacturers, all the big players, as well as aftermarket device makers such as Pioneer. Well, Ericsson's latest quarterly overview of the global market, internet market index showed some impressive connectivity numbers, especially in the U.S. Okay, so let's just go U.S. for a second. 90% of U.S. households have three or more internet connected devices. Well, just under half of those households have five or more devices and about 25% use seven or more. I am definitely in that 25%. I don't know about you. The average number of connected devices per household is 5.2 specifically, but it is climbing. The U.S. is also number one in LTE subscriptions with more than 25% of mobile subscriptions in 2013 being LTE. That number is expected to climb to 40% this year. And here's another stat you might find interesting and frankly, possibly even terrifying. By 2020, Ericsson projects that 90% of the world's population that is over six years old will have a mobile phone. 90%, six years old, crazy. Finally, the Wall Street Journal reports that before the Philae Comet space probe was powered down earlier than expected, one of its instruments discovered an organic compound that was first detected in the comet's atmosphere. Now, this is not just any organic compound, mind you, but one that contains carbon atom, which is, you know, the basis of life here on Earth. <laughs> Further research is now being conducted to see if there are complex compounds like amino acids or simple ones like methane and methanol considered building blocks for proteins as well. The European Space Agency, or ESA, said that the probe fell into hibernation after it got only 1.5 hours of light per day instead of seven, which was expected. It's dark out there. Even though it fell silent, it was still able to send the information it retrieved while it was still functioning, which is how the organic compound discovery was found. Science, everybody! It's amazing. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us at TN2 at twit.tv. Leave us some feedback. We'd love to hear it. And of course, you can watch live every day at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. We have a morning news program as well. Tech News Today will be tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Hope you can watch us both or listen on your commuter, on your walk, or just sitting very quietly staring at the wall. I'm Sarah Lane. See you tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.